module focuses on the 18th century Rococo style. The Baroque style gave way to the more delicate curvilinear forms of the Rococo. International trade brought Asian influences to European dress where they appeared in silks from China and cottons from India. The new style lines were less massive, the curves more slender and delicate and an emphasis was placed on asymmetrical balance. This new style reached its height during the reign of Louis XV. His famous and most influential mistress was Madame de Pompadour, who encouraged authors and helped artists while also serving as the king's political advisor. Her patronage assured artists and artisans of success. In return, they named styles in areas like fans, hairdos, dresses, dishes, sofas, beds, chairs, ribbons, and rose pattern of her favorite porcelain after her. The court became less important during the reign of Louis XVI, partly because Queen Marie Antoinette, an Austrian princess, found the French court stifling. The Queen's dispensing of much traditional court etiquette added to the strains between the royal family and older nobility. Furthermore, she was extravagant at a time when the economy of France was in difficulty. She spent a great deal of money on clothes, shoes and jewellery. France dominated the culture of Western Europe and still set the style in fashion, literature, decorative arts and in philosophical theories. At the same time, writers called philosophies who believed that the application of reason and science would create a better world used the press to unleash a wave of criticism aimed at the abuses in French society and government. The organization of society in England was less centered on the court than that of France. Even though the center of fashionable life was London, small towns and country estates also had their own social class structures and took an interest in fashionable dress. Fashionable clothing was divided into categories according to the time of day the costume was worn or the sort of occasion for which it was appropriate. A man divided his garment, garments among undress or lounging clothes, dress, slightly more formal outfits for daytime or evening, and full dress or the most formal evening dress. A man of means who did not have to work for a living got up late, breakfasted, and received his friends at home in his night gown, which was an informal gown, uh, robe for indoors in the morning. In the afternoon, he went out to a popular spot or to the shops, then to dinner, and then to a play or a coffee house. In the summer, he might go to a spa or a fashionable resort. A man who paid a great deal of attention to his dress was called a beau, a coxcomb, or a fop. Men who adopted French and Italian-inspired fashions were called macaronis. The clothing a woman wore around the house was her undress, half dress, or morning dress. Her habit was either a riding costume or a tailor-made costume. Fashionable ladies spent their mornings in bed, where they reclined while receiving guests. Several hours were required for the late-rising lady to dress. In the afternoon, she visited friends or drank tea. After dinner, her evenings were spent in card playing and dancing. The middle class also travelled to spas for vacations. Many of the forms of entertainment, especially the outdoor amusement parks and the theatre, provided opportunities for the mingling of the social classes. Major advances in textile technology was made during this period. The flying shuttle, a device that automatically carried the yarn across the fabric, was invented in 1733. The resulting increase in speed of weaving meant the weaver consumed yarn more rapidly. Most of these advances were applied to the spinning of cotton. As a result, cotton fabrics became available at much lower prices than before and stimulated the use of cotton fabrics. Museum collections include many more actual garments of this period, though mostly they belong to the upper class. Portraits and paintings are also excellent sources of information. Fashion babies or dolls and fashion plates were used to circulate information about the latest styles of fashion. 
Women wore a chemise with a petticoat skirt and a hip-length garment called short gown, which was like a jacket or an overblouse. A serviceable apron was worn over this, a kerchief at the neck together with a simple covering for head. Farmers and artisans wore loose smocks over breeches. It was made of coarse linen for summer and wool in winter. A leather apron was worn over the smock. Costumes in the 18th century were also influenced in a number of ways. Eastern textiles were very important. Not only oriental silk brocades and damasks and Indian chins, calico and muslin fabrics, but also European copies of these fabrics were made into handsome garments. English styles for both men and women had a significant impact on Parisian fashion. In women's clothes, Anglomania became evident in a vogue for simpler styles for English riding coats, which were called Reading Goats. Frenchmen copied English tailoring and, except for coat functions, wore simpler, undecorated suits and affected a more casual mode of dress. Costumes for men. For men, drawers were worn next to the skin, under the breeches, and were equivalent to modern undershorts. They closed at the waist with drawstrings or buttons, were made of white cotton or wool and ended at the knee. Shirts had ruffled frills at the front of the neck and at the end of the sleeves. Slo collars and cravats were made of white cotton or linen. The Steinkirk was a style of cravat in which the tie pulled through the buttonhole and twisted loosely. During cold weather, men wore a second waistcoat either over or under the shirt. Waistcoats sometimes had a collar. Dress coats, breeches and waistcoats were usually made from less decorative fabrics. Full dress garments were made with elaborate brocades and trimmed with handsome embroidery and lace. Coats were knee length and were buttoned to the hem until 1720. After that, they only closed to the waist. Buckram stiffening was used to hold out the full skirts of coats. Side seams were usually left open from below the waist to accommodate swords. Pockets were usually positioned at hip level and had scalloped edged flaps. Until the 1730s, most sleeves tended to end in large, full attached cuffs that either closed all around or were open at the back. Cuffs that reached the elbows were called boot cuffs. An alternative style had no cuffs and was slit at the back to expose the sleeve ruffle. After the mid-century, the front of the coats curved towards the side. A narrow stand-up collar appeared and the silhouette narrowed. Cravats were replaced by stocks, a linen square folded to form a high neckband that was stiffened with buckram and fastened behind the neck. Often, a length of black ribbon tied in a bow at the front was worn over the stock. Waistcoats followed the lines of the outer coats, ending close to the knee. They also matched the outer coats in colour and fabric. After the mid-century, waistcoats became shorter. Since the coats were worn open, waistcoats became the centre of attention and more brocades or elaborately embroidered silks were used. The cut of breeches was moderately full. The seat was cut very full and gathered to a waistband that rode loosely fitted below the waist. Breeches ended at the knee, often being just barely visible when the coat was closed. They closed at the front with buttons or after 1730s with a fall, a square central flap that buttoned to the waistline. Frock coats were cut looser and shorter than dress coats and they had flat turn down collars. It was considered suitable for country wear and was later accepted for more formal wear as well. They were not embroidered and usually were made from fabrics like serge, plush or sturdy woven cloth. The smock frock was worn by English agricultural workers and it was frequently embroidered with a type of embroidery now called smocking. When the waistcoat, breeches and outer coats were made of the same fabrics, it was called a ditto suit. Comfortable, loosely fitted garments, variously known as night gowns, morning gowns, dressing gowns, Indian gowns or banyans were worn throughout the century as casual or undress at home. Fabrics for these garments included cotton calicos, 
silks, damask, brocades, velvets, taffetas or satins and wool, worsteds and calamancos. Most men who could afford them wore wigs. Wig styles included full bottomed wig, the French toupee or in English foretop in which the hair was brushed straight back from the forehead and into a slightly elevated roll. By the mid-century, hair was dressed higher and wider. Other styles included wigs with cues and club wigs or catagons, in which cues were doubled up on themselves and tied at the middle to form a loop of hair. Hats became less important. The three-cornered hat, large flat hat called chapeau, chapeau bras, was carried under the arm rather than worn, and two-cornered hats called bicones and tricones were worn for riding. Later top hats called round hats were used for the same. At home, men wore round caps with flat turned up brim, brims that fit closely to the crown or something like a turban. For footwear, stockings were long and ended above the knee. By the late century, some men would wear artificial calves padding strapped to their hose or legs to give a more fashionable appearance. Shoes had square toes, high square heels and large square tongues. Later shapes were rounder and the heels not so high. Decorative buckles were used and red heels were favoured for court dress. Slippers and dress shoes had low heels and flat soles. Outdoors sturdy shoes were used with splatter dashers, also called splats or gaiters, separate protective covering for shoes. Boots of various shapes and sizes were worn for riding, travelling and military. Men used muffs, walking sticks, watches, pocket books and decorated snuff boxes. They wore rings, some brooches and jewelled shoe buckles. Men also used powder and perfume and were clean shaven. Women wore chemises under petticoats and supportive hoops as undergarments. Chemises were knee length and cut full with wide neckline edges with lace which often showed at the neckline of the outer dress. Sleeves were full to the elbow but not visible. Worn over the chemise but under the hoop, under petticoats were fairly straight cut made of cambric, dimity, flannel or calico. In winter they were quilted for warmth. Corsets commonly called stays were made of coarse fabric or they were covered at the front by dress fabric. Both front and back were boned. Most were laced up at the back, although some were laced both front and back. For stout or pregnant women, side lacings were also added. Jumps were loose, unboned bodices worn at home to provide relief from tight corseting. The hoops were similar to farthingales. The shape was more rounded like a dome. The shape became narrower from front to back and wider from side to side. These hoops were made of whalebone and metal. The shape of the hoops changed to look like wicked basket-like shapes, one worn over each hip. By the late 17th century, panniers were replaced by hip pads. Skirt fullness swung from sides to the back and a false rump pad tied at the back of the waist supported the fullness. Towards the end of the century, skirts shortened, revealing the leg above the ankle. The polonaise was an overdress and petticoat in which the overskirt was puffed and looped by means of tapes and rings sewn to the skirt. A hoop or bustle supported the skirt. Gowns could be either loose or fitted. Sack, robe batant, robe volant and innocente are names for a gown that was unbelted, loose, from the shoulder to the floor. Made with pleats at the back and at the shoulder at the front, sacks were worn over a dome-shaped hoop and might either have a close front or be open uh, over a corset and petticoat. Other styles included the petten layer, which was a short, hip-length version worn with separate gathered skirt and a mentua-style gown cut in one piece from shoulder to hem that was fitted to the body in front and back. The Lope et la France had a full pleated cut at the back and a fitted front. This style was also called Watteau back due to the painter who favoured this detail in his paintings. The robe a la Anglaise had a close fit in the front and at the back. 
Most gowns had open bodices and skirts that allowed the display of decorative summerkers and petticoats. Round gowns were closed all the way down the front. Red and gold dresses resembled buttoned greatcoats of English riding coats with wide lapels or revers at the neck. The chemise à la reine was a white muslin gown resembling the chemise, had a waistline and a soft, fully gathered skirt. The stomacher, a triangular piece, had tabs on the sides and was pinned either to the bodice or to the stays. Some were decorated with embroidery. Others were covered with ribbons or artificial flowers or laces. The neckline of these gowns were usually low and square or oval in shape. Sleeves ended below the elbow, finishing in one or more ruffles called engagements. When garments consisted of separate tops worn over petticoats or skirts, the skirts were full, supported by panniers. Fashionable tops included the short sack or petten layer and a jacket cassockin that was fitted through the bodice and flaring out below the waist, almost to the knees. Sleeves were tight and a small turned back cuff. Cloaks were cut full to fit over wide skirts. Fabrics included velvet and wool with fur trims for cold and silk or other lightweight fabrics for warm weather. Scarves, shawls and wraps with or without sleeves were used. Narrow fur or feather pieces like modern day stoles but called tippets were worn around the shoulders. Waved loosely around the face, the hair was twisted into a small roll or bun, worn at the top of the head towards the back or alternatively arranged around the face in ringlets or waves. Women also powdered their hair for formal occasions. For indoors, women wore pinners, circular caps with single or double frills around the edge that were placed flat on the head or mop caps. These caps were enlarged when hairstyles, hairstyles grew bigger. Lace trimmings were used for decorations. Long lace or fabric streamers hung from the edges to tie under the chin. Outdoors, women covered their heads with hoods or wore straw or silk hats with narrow brims and trimmed with narrow ribbon bands. Large brimmed hats called bergerer or shepherdess hats were also worn. Hoods with a series of semi-hoops sewn within were called calishes or calishes to accommodate the large hairstyles without flattening them. By the mid-century, hair was smooth and high on top in toupee fashion, then arranged in a bun at the top of the head or a plate at the back. Tete de mouton was another style in which tight curls were placed around the head. Hairstyles expanded to extreme sizes by the late 17th century. It was dressed higher and frizzed around the face. Maximum sizes were achieved when styles were supplemented by feathers, jewels and ribbons. This changed to an arrangement of sausage curls flat against the head running from ear to ear. The hedgehog fashion was hair curled full and wide around the face and long locks hanging at the back. For footwear, stockings extended to the knees and were held in place by garters. Shoes had pointy toes, high heels, tongues and side pieces called latchets that fastened over the insect. Backless slippers or mules with low heels and turned up toes were popular. Clogs or patterns were used for wet outdoors. Country people wore wooden clogs. Gloves, mittens or fingerless gloves and muffs were used. Pockets were not sewn into dresses but were bags sewn into a ribbon and tied around the waist. Small bags were also carried. Other accessories included folding fans, parasols and black masks mounted on sticks. Necklaces with matching earrings, gold watches around the neck, jeweled hairpins and hair ornaments and jeweled buckles for shoes. Amongst the most popular necklaces was a row of pearl chains, lockets, pendants and crosses. Lips, cheeks and fingernails could be coloured red with rouge. Eyebrows were shaped with scissors or by plucking and blackened with combs of soft lead. Patches and plumpers continued in use. The usual clothes for toddlers up to the age of six or seven were dresses or robes. Boys older than seven or eight wore long straight trousers, a white shirt with a white collar that finished in a ruffled edge and over the shirt 
a simplified adult jacket and was called a skeleton suit. Girls wore simple straight dresses, often of white muslin with slightly elevated waistlines. At the age of 11 or 12, boys and girls assumed adult dress.